Hi everybody, um, welcome to the Integration Station uh, Battery Startup Showcase event. Um, while we're waiting for everybody to come in, um, it's great to see uh, 50 people joining already um, and more coming in fast. Um, so today we have six very exciting companies um, in the battery space um, and they're going to be pitching their companies and all the exciting things that they're doing. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Intercalation Station. Um, Intercalation was first started in 2020 as an independent research organisation. Um, we strive to communicate the latest technical research topics to a global audience, um, informing about real science um, with expert insight. Um, we also like connecting the battery community together um, and supporting battery related career development, uh, just like what we're doing now, connecting lots of people from the battery community um, and lots of interesting endeavours as well. Um, we provide technical insights and assessments for energy storage technologies, um, and we help build knowledge gaps, not just across uh, academia, but also industry and governments. Um, we really want to build more live events, just like this one. Um, we recently did an in-person event in London, um, where we gathered people from industry, academia, um, investment community as well, um, and had a really nice social and it was you know brilliant to get together I know I, I met lots of people that I hadn't met in person before um, then and it was it was wonderful um, so uh, this event is also being co-hosted by the Volta Foundation um, the Volta Foundation is a non-profit serving the battery industry um, it's a community of 30,000 battery professionals representing 5,000 organizations um, the foundation produces monthly events, so I'm sure lots of you will have heard of Battery Brunch, uh, the famous Battery Brunch, um, publications such as Battery Bits, um, and the industry reports, um, and also open communication channels to provide um, a really vibrant global battery ecosystem. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my first speaker, um, who is Gavin White from About Energy. Yes, thank you very much, Sophia, and uh, to Nicholas for hosting this event and for having me today. I'll just share a screen quickly. So, can you see that okay? Yes, yeah, Sophia, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. well, thanks everyone for joining today. So my name's Gavin. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and the CEO of About Energy. And About Energy is a battery testing and modeling company that spun out of Imperial College London and the University of Birmingham. So the problem we're trying to solve is that um, battery models are used for many things now. So things like state of charge estimation, state of health estimation, designing the systems up front, predicting degradation, but also assessing second life. Um, and at the moment, battery models aren't trusted to the same level that they should be. Um, and a lot of battery development is done through trial and error, which is extremely expensive and inefficient. And there's lots of packages out there. I'm sure most of the people on the call recognize a lot of these company logos. Um, for modeling batteries, but these these packages, they literally just um, are a mathematical implementation um, solved in the battery models. But these models are actually fundamentally limited by the inputs, and it's garbage in, garbage out. And for a DFN model in Python, for example, there's 48 different things you have to measure, but only three measurable outputs. So our solution to this is bringing together a huge amount of IP at both Imperial College London, where I did my PhD, and also the University of Birmingham, where my co-founder did his PhD. Um, and that encompasses both a pattern and a huge amount of know-how. And the idea is that we're a one-stop shop for battery testing and modeling, so whether that's physics-based equipment circuit or thermal. And now we want to take this expertise and actually build a battery database. So the core of the company will always be parameterization and measuring these model inputs. But now we want to build this into a database that we're calling the vault. And the vault has two, two halves to it. One is the proprietary cell side, so that's cell manufacturers and large automotive OEMs. And the other side is actually the commercial cell side. So that's where we buy cells from LG, Panasonic, Sony, um, and we build models of these. Um, and with the commercial cells, we want to offer a number of different products and services um, to help everybody. So even things like having a common data sheet um, between these cells, but also having equivalent circuit thermal and physics-based model models downloadable for each. And we want to deliver this through our cloud platform based on AWS. So in terms of technology, um, IP is definitely our biggest strength. 
Um, within parameterization, we have lots of different methods that come together to make ours world leading, um, such as our advanced temperature controller that I developed through my PhD. We have a huge amount of experimental know-how. Uh, we have that patent for thermal conductivity, which I filed through my PhD, um, and also a huge amount of uh, parameter extraction and modeling software that we're building up now. So in terms of directors, we have myself, the CEO, my co-founder, Kieran, the CEO. Um, we actually managed to get Neil Morris, who was the founding CEO of the Faraday Institution, who's joined as our chairman. And um, we also have Professor Emma Kendrick from Birmingham, um, Yatish from Imperial, Alistair from Bristol, and then one of our investors um, that started a, a company at Imperial um, called S-Cube, um, and that's Nick. So in terms of where we position ourselves in the market, it's a very competitive space, but we think we offer a very unique solution, um, unlike uh, what else is out there. So ours is multi-behavior in that you can simulate both equivalent circuit models and physics-based and thermal, but it's also white box. Our IP is in measuring the inputs that go into the models, not the models themselves. And that allows us to open up the actual models so you can see, see how they work, what mathematics is implemented. Now we hold some of the implementation back to um, keep our own IP, but we, this allows um, our customers to actually go in and see how the model works, they can understand better how the actual battery works. Um, and is what drives us forward is kind of this accelerating electrification. We want to help people optimize battery packs and in the end of the day, decrease CO2. So future plans um, over the next um, 18 months, we're really going to focus on the strategic partnerships. Um, we already have a few big customers. And we really want to focus on delivering value for them. But we also want to um, launch this web platform called The Vault. Um, that will be a very transactional relationship, which will allow us to have a much bigger impact um, across the market. And right now, we're seeking a number of different um, people to help us on this journey. So a lot of um, industry experts, especially from automotive OEMs and cell manufacturing, to give us advice on how we can sculpt our products and services, but also help us from a business point of view. Um, and then there's also business angels. So ahead of our next round, we want to open up um, small check size from like 10 to 50,000 pound of people that can buy into this journey and help us with it. Um, and over the next few years, we want to develop the vault, our battery models and our cloud service. And all of this is built on top of parameterization. So my name's Gavin. Thank you very much for the call to, or for joining the call today. And I'd love to hear any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gavin, um, for that talk. Um, does anybody else, uh, does anybody have any questions for Gavin um, at all? Um, you can put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll have questions after each talk. Um, and uh, I can ask Gavin uh, anything that you'd like to know about, about energy. Um, so if, if not, I've got a question. Um, so Gavin, I was wondering, I mean, you know, you founded this, this startup. Um, what do you think was the, the biggest challenge uh, founding the startup and how did you overcome that? Yeah, I think there's so many challenges mm. um, forming a spin-out company. Probably the biggest one is actually finishing a PhD alongside yeah. that. So it's balancing both your academic commitments and commercial commitments, as well as obviously with a spin-out company, you have to do a huge amount of research in order to make your first products and services. Um, and coming from an academic background, um, is trying to draw the line as to you know when is good enough good enough um, and that's what I found really exciting about the startup is getting speaking to people in industry and learning you know what are the real challenges and what do they need to help get them over the line you know the model doesn't have to be 100% perfect and um, 90% with some extra features functionality and speed is much better than a model that's 100% accurate but takes much more longer so that's why I found really exciting the last year was actually kind of this process of doing both. And, and now thankfully I can leave the kind of academic research behind and focus on the commercials. Oh, it's really interesting. And you know, it's, it's so impressive that you managed to found a startup during your PhD as well. Um, so we've got lots and lots of questions coming in. We won't have many much time for questions, um, but I'll be recording all these questions um, and you yeah. know, just, just keep them in, keep them in mind. Um, but uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, how do you intend to differentiate in an increasingly crowded space? Um, yeah. That's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, so many interesting uh, battery modeling things coming through. So, yeah, really yeah. excited to hear this answer. Yeah, definitely. So and that's what we've identified. It is a very crowded space and it's getting busier literally by the day. But I think our key differentiator is that RIP is in the actual parameterization, actually the measurements that go into the models. 
which means the models we provide, we can really open the box on them and provide like a white box solution. And this is something that our early customers absolutely love because they can actually go inside the model and see, see how we're solving these equations um, and how the model works. And it allows them to bolt on their own things to really tailor it for the application. So I see our, our key differentiator is this white box solution. And we're able to do that because our IP is in the measurement. Um, I'll take one more question. Um, where do you get your test results from? Um, do you work together with cell manufacturers or OEMs? Uh, so we actually do all the measurements ourselves. Um, and my co-founder, Kieran, I think he's quite famous in the battery community because he was the first person to open source a full Python DFN parameter set for the LGM50. Um, and unlike, so I, I always want to start a business. My co-founder, Kieran, just did some research. And I think he got pulled into business because there was so much commercial potential. But that's something we do in-house ourselves. And at the moment, we're still based at Imperial College London and the University of Birmingham. And we have access to the facilities here to scan the electron microscope. Um, et cetera, to take these measurements in-house. And that's really the key piece of IP um, in our company. Oh, that's great. Um, it's really good that you did all your own uh, testing as, as well. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, um, but maybe at the end of the event, we'll be able to ask a few more. Um, it's so great to see everybody really engaged and um, interested. Um, in yeah, thanks very much for the questions. Yeah. And please connect yeah. on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Um, thank you, Gavin. And um, so next we have uh, Sarah from Impios. Amazing. Thanks so much, Sophia, and thanks for organizing this event. Let me just hop into sharing my screen as well. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this now. So yeah, as Sophia is saying, I'm Sarah, co-founder, CEO of Impius, and we are on a mission to build a future where every battery and its supply chain is sustainable. So given everyone on this call is focused on batteries, it's probably no surprise that we know that the clean energy and clean mobility boom means that battery demand is about to explode. And so we should think that battery makers and car makers should be pretty happy about the situation right now. But one reality is that they have these huge, global, complex, opaque supply chains that they're having to figure out how to navigate that is acting as a huge barrier to their potential growth. And so from child labor to water scarcity, from deforestation to excessive waste, fossil fuel power manufacturing to raw material shortages, we're seeing that the clean tech that we're moving to is actually nowhere near as clean as we would like it to be. And on top of that, we've got some of the most progressive battery and supply chain sustainability regulation coming into place over the next couple of years. And so whilst it takes 10 years to build a lithium mine, it takes just one bad supply chain disruption or headline to slash the health of your battery business. And so this means that we're in a position where car makers and regulator, regulators recognize that supply chains will make or break the success of a battery maker. And so at Infius, this is where we come in to help fast growing battery supply chain players, such as battery makers, car makers, or energy storage companies, be able to manage and improve the sustainability of their supply chain. How exactly we do this? We have four main ways for helping our customers become sustainability leaders. We help them be able to view key sustainability impacts and requirements across their supply chain, build a data-driven strategy in order to address these impacts, then go from strategy to implementation with the tools they need to actually manage their impacts and then engage their suppliers on the journey with them. So how are we already making this happen? So we were founded in the middle of last year. We validated the problem and our solution with over 100 battery supply chain players and are actively engaging with over 15 battery and car makers at the moment. We've secured key strategic advisors and partners to drive industry adoption of our solution. We closed our angel round at the beginning of this year and also launched our MVP. Then in April of this year, we got our first enterprise customer on board who's paying 72,000 pounds per year for access to the platform. We've co-developed that out with them and launched that in June. And then we opened up for our 1 million fundraise, which we're in final stages of at the moment. And the goal of that is to then expand out the platform across multiple other customers into the end of next year, having over 1 million annual revenue from customers by the end of next year. We're starting with high growth European battery makers, but our ambitions are much bigger than that. 
the overlap in supply chains and their materials means that we're naturally able to scale across new industries from automotive into other types of automotive suppliers, into electronics and clean energy. Why exactly we're doing this? Well, myself and my co-founder Tony have backgrounds in supply chain tech, in sustainability and in the battery industry. I previously built the China and Asia expansion at a company called Everledger, which is a supply chain traceability startup. I've been part of the World Economic Forum's Global Battery Alliance and their Greenhouse Gas Working Group. And I speak Chinese and have worked in China where the majority of the world's battery supply chain players are based. And then as for my co-founder, Tony, he has deep experience in software and supply chain tech. He was previously co-founder and CTO of Pact Coffee, a supply chain startup which he took from zero to series A and over 4 million annual revenue. And on top of that, we have some amazing advisors on board, such as Rob, who's ex-head of supply chain at Jaguar Land Rover, Toyota, and um, Rolls-Royce. And then Oyvind, who's a serial entrepreneur in the B2B SaaS world. So kind of wrapping up and back to the beginning, when we see the opportunity we're, that we're facing, we see that we're only just at the beginning of this huge explosion of clean technology. And therefore we still have a choice about how exactly we do it. At Infius, we believe we can do it better. And so we invite you to join us on this journey to build a future where every battery and its supply chain is sustainable. Thanks so much. And very much look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Please put them in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we have some questions coming in. Um, we have a question, um, what is different in your approach compared to competitors like Circular? Yeah, very good question. So yeah, Circular and Everledger, where I used to work, is kind of traditionally track and trace. So what they're doing is physically bagging and tagging items and tracking them as they move through the supply chain. Because of like the physical nature of that technology, you have to be very on the ground with the technology that you're doing, and you can only focus on the certain supply chains where you're actually physically tracking. What we realize with that is that that is great if you as a customer want to get a super granular approach of, I want to know exactly which mine my cobalt came from and so on. But the reality is that you have cobalt, you have lithium, you have nickel, you have manganese, you have a huge variety of different materials coming across the world from huge supply chains and actually track and trace is so granular that you can only ever cover a tiny amount of your supply chain and it's gonna take decades to get full coverage across your supply chain. Therefore, the big challenge for these battery makers and car makers and so on is how do I actually manage sustainability across the entirety of my supply chain, across the entirety of its social and environmental impacts in a way that is actually you know, feasible based on the business that I am today and can kind of gradually improve over time. And so with that approach, our approach is effectively, we build the data analysis across the entirety of the supply chain, the entirety of material, key materials and key impacts, rather than taking a very, very granular supply chain thread by supply chain thread approach. But I think the other really important thing as well is that what we saw was that just giving people data on their supply chain does not actually lead to them improving their supply chain. You kind of have the data back for them and then you've got to hope either they understand what to do with it and they'll do something about it, or quite often they just don't do anything about it because they kind of see that as the last point. But the ultimate goal for our customers is how do I actually become a sustainability leader and manage sustainability to improve sustainability? And so for that, the that's where the platform combines both the supply chain data analysis, but also with the data-driven strategy implementation and management so that they can actually engage with their supply chain and improve their supply chain on the ground by working with their suppliers and so on. And so, yeah, that's where, that's where there's a quite a, I think, actually kind of, I would say complementary in terms of work that what Track and Trace does and what we're doing um, in, in the kind of space of supply chains. Oh, that's great. Um, such a detailed answer. And, um, you know, I mean, it really speaks to, I mean, the ba battery supply chains can be so complex and it's a really interesting topic to get into. So it's great to hear about that. And um, we've got time for one more quick question. Um, so we have a question. Can you give a concrete example 
um, of how you've helped a customer provide insights and then helped implement actionable improvements. Um, or, or just, you know, maybe say, say how, how you might do that uh, and, and how yeah. you, you make improvements. Cool. Yeah, sure. I will. I'll give a pretty simple example, just so yeah. I don't take too long. But you know, <laughs> as an example, you're a battery maker. We help you understand what are your key sustainability impacts. Unsurprisingly, one of those is going to be energy and greenhouse gas emissions. Aside from that, we also help you understand what are your stakeholder requirements around sustainability. So what are the customer requirements, investor requirements, regulation requirements on these sustainability topics? So as an example, in energy and GHGs, you're a battery maker trying to sell into BMW. BMW have set a goal that by 2040, their entire supply chain is going to be net zero. Therefore, when it comes to understanding your impacts and your requirements, it's really helpful for you to understand, okay, of the customers I'm trying to sell into, what are their specific requirements? And then in terms of how that becomes actionable is in terms of the strategy management, when we're supporting in giving recommendations for long-term goals, we will say, okay, you've told us, that BMW is one of the, the customers you're trying to sell into. Therefore, when you're setting your long-term goal for energy and greenhouse gas emissions, you want to make sure it's at least by 2040, your entire supply chain is going to be net zero. But then also based on the data we have on what they're currently doing, we can see, okay, right now you're not even measuring your scope one and two carbon emissions. Therefore, in terms of short and medium term goals, one of the short and medium term goals will be measure your carbon emissions uh, for scope one and two, you know, set a reduction target, get certified against one of the key standards such as ISO or past 2060. And then also then being able to track the data relating to that and the certification relating to that, and then being able to you know, go into a customer conversation with BMW and say, look, I recognize what my biggest impacts were. I recognize what your requirements are around energy and GHGs. This is a strategy I have in place. This is the progress I'm making towards that strategy. And here is the data and evidence of this. And effectively, actually, one of the biggest kind of benefits of the platform is helping the supply chain and sustainability team, but it's actually really helping the sales and the customer facing team be able to get win contracts with some of these large car makers and so on. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you very much, Sarah. We'll now move swiftly on to our next speaker, who is Lucas um, from Ipsos Technology. That's right. Hi, everybody. I'm not in the best uh, Wi-Fi place, so I'm going to keep my video off for the talk. I hope that that solves the problems. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Lucas. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Epnus Technology. Epnus Technology was founded about two and a half years ago during my PhD at UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And um, it's our mission to um, make commodity chemicals using um, a process called electrolysis instead of chemical reagents um, and other fossil fuel derived uh, feedstocks. So what is electrolysis? Electrolysis is a process by which matter can be transformed using electricity. It's a manufacturing technique um, and uh, it does not rely on um, fossil fuel uh, derived feedstocks and or heat. Um, so as long as an electrolysis process is fed with uh, renewably produ produced electricity, um, it's technically carbon neutral. And um, there's actually a long list of commodity chemicals that you can see here on the left-hand side that could be made uh, using this process that takes place in um, electrolyzer reactors, what they're called, um, that are stacks of electrodes and membranes that you can see on the right-hand side there. And um, while Ectris, EPNIS is uh, envisioning to eventually, you know, produce all of these chemicals like, uh, electrolytically, we're uh, currently focused most on the production of lithium hydroxide, battery grade lithium hydroxide, as it goes into lithium um, ion batteries. As you will be very well aware, um, there is um, tons of battery projects popping up all over the world. Um, and there simply is not enough lithium to, to go around to um, build all the batteries that we need to electrify the transportation sector um, and other industrial sectors out there. Um, and as a consequence, um, you know, the Western world, the US and, and Europe are um, scrambling to ramp up their own uh, battery mineral supply chains, um, especially for lithium to be able to uh, source enough of these minerals to be able to to keep up battery supplies um 
here's a map of um, where many of these batteries come from um, in the in the U.S. context, which is you know where we are located and where we are um, mostly operating at this point in time. So lithium, especially, is mostly sourced from countries like Chile, Australia, ultimately processed and refined in China, and then uh, transported to the U.S. And the same is true for many other. Um, of the battery uh, ingredients, which could also all be refined using electrolytic processes. Um, to dive a little bit more deeply into um, how, you know, Epnesis technology slots into an existing flow sheet, um, let me first tell you a little bit about how uh, lithium is currently being refined. So at the top here, you see um, a traditional so-called caustic lithium refinement flow sheet, uh, where lithium is first leached from a lithium containing feedstock, um, be that a spodumene mineral, um, a clay mineral, or even an old to be recycled battery um, using sulfuric acid. Um, after the sulfuric acid leach, lithium is produced as a lithium sulfate brine, and that then needs to be converted into lithium hydroxide uh, to be inputted into a, into a battery. Um, for this purpose, usually sodium hydroxide or lime, calcium hydroxide, is added um, in, a, in a big reactor. Um, and uh, lithium is, you know, as a consequence, produced as lithium hydroxide with a significant sodium sulfate waste stream that's being produced. And it's, you know, the disposal of this waste stream, the sodium sulfate waste stream, um, together with these um, reagent chemical inputs, the sulfuric acid as well as the sodium hydroxide, that make up for the majority of um, costs that are associated with this process. Um, and it's also, uh, you know, these last two steps, especially the addition of the, of the sodium hydroxide to crystallize out the sodium sulfate and the lithium hydroxide um, that generate the majority of emissions that are associated with lithium manufacture, generally speaking. So this flow sheet, as it's employed by, by mining companies in Australia um, and also Canada, um, produces about five tons of CO2 emissions per ton of lithium hydroxide that's produced. Um, and here is what the flow sheet looks like if um, Epnesis electrolysis process was to be used instead. All right, so we can take in the lithium sulfate stream directly uh, and through the addition of electricity to our system, split water molecules to make hydroxide ions in situ, making lithium hydroxide in one step um, and recovering the sulfuric acid that's needed for the leach process in the very beginning. Um, here is you know, a little bit more uh, granular, high resolution information of what goes on in, in, in a salt splitting electrolysis cell, such as the um, one that, that we are scaling up in the, at the moment. All right, so um, electrolysis reactors, generally speaking, contain um, anodes and cathodes, so negatively and positively charged electrodes that are separated by membranes. Um, those are fed with the lithium sulfate brine that I mentioned earlier. Um, by applying an electric field to the system, you can make the lithium cross um, over the membrane. And, and there's two reactions taking place, one on the anode and one on the cathode, both involving the splitting of water molecules to produce protons to be able to reduce and, and regenerate the, the acid on the anode side um, and the production of hydroxide ions to um, from water produce essentially base to, to um, generate the lithium hydroxide output. Uh, and so this way that we can you know, avoid not just the um, generation of sodium sulfate waste, which is um, costly and uh, difficult to dispose of, but we can also minimize the reliance on reagent chemical inputs uh, and split water molecules to produce acid and base in situ instead. Um, there's a number of things that uh, you, we do better than conventional electrolysis systems. Namely, we um, minimize the use of platinum group metal catalysts. Um, we have a special secret sauce ingredient that allows us to you know, enhance the catalytic surface area of our reactors, which means that we can make reactors that are smaller in footprint. So they use less membranes, they're more efficient and cheaper. And at scale, we anticipate that our electrolysis systems Will about be will, will be about fifty percent um, cheaper to build and thirty percent cheaper to operate as compared to the traditional thermochemical caustic leach flow sheets that I showed earlier that require you know sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide uh, chemical inputs. 
Um, there's a number of other companies out there that are focusing, roughly speaking, on 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 you know building similar technologies that you might want to check out if you're interested. Um, we have, you know, in our humble opinion, <laughs> uh, significant operational advantages compared to them all, and um, have at this point over the last year and a half engaged with a number of mostly North American um, players in the lithium mining as well as the lithium mineral um, and lithium ion battery recycling field. Um, there's a number of feasibility studies that we're currently running with, um, you know, different companies in the space. And the idea is to, um, over the next 18 months, scale our system into a five ton a year pilot, um, which will then, you know, in another three to four year push, be turned into 250 ton a year lithium hydroxide facility, um, likely either in Southern California or in Nevada, which is where most of the US's um, lithium deposits occur. This slide is a little bit outdated, but um, it is the team that we started with about two and a half years ago. So, you know, myself as well as my co-founder are have, have deep ties to um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is where I did my PhD and B. Len did his postdoc. That is still where we um, are, you know, um, where, where we have access to lab space and are, are tinkering and, and are upscaling up our technology. Um, and we are very much supported by, um, um, other, you know, researchers, both at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, as well as UC Berkeley, that uh, have research backgrounds in, in fields tangential to what we're doing and that have been, you know, supporting us. Um, to conclude, right, where are we and where are we going? Um, as I said, right now, um, we, you know, we, we, we closed our um, seed round in, in February, so um, have money to take our system to the next larger scale. That's um, what we are mostly spending our time on, heads down in a lab in scale up mode. Um, we are a total of six people at this point um, with uh, two interns um, that, that you know, we work together. Um, and we also have um, joined a number of awesome networks and um, incubator programs that, that are supporting us. So we are part of the Activate uh, Fellowship, which is a DOE funded um, fellowship program that uh, allows us to be firmly embedded into the American national lab system. Um, you know, here's a list of our investors, Lower Carbon and, and Voyager being the main ones. Uh, we received some money from um, funding programs like CalSeed and uh, as I said, continue to work very closely with, uh, with LBNL. Thank you very much for having me and I hope that uh, this connection wasn't too choppy. Please, uh, yeah, ask me some questions. Hi, Lucas. Um, thank you so much um, for your really interesting talk. Um, so we uh, only have time for one very, very quick question. Um, and uh, Lucas, if you've got time, you can always go and type an answer live um, in, in the chat um, after this. Um, so the question that I'm going to ask is, um, how does your electrolysis process compare to the conventional process in terms of safety, speed, and scalability? Electrolytic processes, I mean, first of all, sorry for running over and for cutting this Q&A session short, but um, electro electro electrolytic processes are actually quite similar in, uh, in architecture to batteries, meaning that our electrolyzers um, can actually be operated, you know, in parallel and series, depending on the size of process that we're trying to service. Um, and so I would say that electrolysis is actually a, a very scalable process um, that uh, yeah, can easily be adjusted to, to you know, the, the size of operation we try to support by simply you know, like having more of our electrolysis cell run um, in series. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure I'll put, put information about uh, how to get in touch with Lucas and um, all of the other companies um, in a follow-up email after the event um, so you can find out even more. Um, so now we'll go to our next speaker. We have um, Alex from Carbonscape. Hello everyone and, and thanks Sophia for giving me the chance to uh, talk today and, and also Nick with the intercalation team. Um, my name's Alex Westlake. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Carbonscape. 
which is a New Zealand based company that has cracked the code for taking waste wood like biochar or wood chips and converting it into battery grade graphite. Um, so we're on a mission basically to reduce emissions from lithium iron battery production. And as I said, we take sustainable timber residues and we convert that into graphite for the anodes of mobility and electronics batteries. The beauty of using timber residues is abundant. Um, it can be localized and be create the anode materials close to the, uh, the gigafactories in, in Europe, North America and Asia. The problem we're aiming to solve is, as you can see on the left, um, current graphite production is unsustainable. You know, it comes from synthetic graphite, which is uh, pet coke feedstocks from the fossil fuel industry, or it's mined uh, as, as natural graphite. So it's a, a legacy industrial approach. It's very carbon intensive, and it leads to very high battery miles, because we take the battery from the mine in, say, Africa to China for processing, and then back um, to the EVs around the world. Now, our solution takes a sort of a circular economy approach. It's actually carbon negative. It's the only anode production method in the world that is carbon negative. And that is because the tree absorbs carbon. We have some process emissions, but we don't use more of the process uh, emissions than the tree has absorbed from the atmosphere. So the solution can be lead to sort of local sourcing, which solves all the supply chain headaches um, that battery manufacturers have, 4x risks, and it's cheaper to produce because our feedstock cost is a lot lower than you know, natural or synthetic graphite feedstocks. We have a great opportunity ahead of us. As we all know, the EV market is accelerating very quickly, addressable market by 2030 of about 14, 15 billion dollars. But what really drives us as a company is that we can reduce the emissions from the battery supply chain and thereby lower the carbon footprint of cars. So for every ton of biographite we produce, we'll save about 15 to 20 tons of CO2 um, uh, versus synthetic uh, graphite. And if we, we have an opportunity now, as we build out the whole anode supply chain globally, we have an opportunity to, if we all use biographite and there's abundant wood resources to do that, we could reduce emissions by about 100 million tons of CO2 per year by 2040. That's why the politicians around the world are, you know, getting excited, and and you've got, um, reg, you know, legislation like the Biden uh, Inflation Reduction Act. You've got the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. All, all of these will drive localization of supply chains, and Carbonscape obviously has very large uh, tailwinds on the back of that. In terms of our process. Um, it's a continuous process, so that's very different from the traditional batch processing in other, other graphites. It's also a lower temperature process, so it's less than uh, half of the, temp the 3000 degrees C that a conventional graphite process would need. It also has a, uses a clean catalyst, which we recover, versus some of the other catalysts in, in the other processes which are uh, less environmentally friendly. And it sort of delivers a, a very high performance biographite, which is coated and spheralized like, like other um, synthetic graphites. In terms of performance, um, we've done a lot of testing with third party testing, but also with our cell partners um, who are industry partners, uh, both anode manufacturers and cell manufacturers. And we have a um, first cycle efficiency of around 94%. The microstructure is very similar to synthetic graphite, and therefore there's not very much swelling in the end cell. And we've produced 100 tons uh, at, at, a, at a rate of 100 tons per year. And we will be scaling up from that 100 tons per year to 1,000 and then 10,000 tons per year. Um, and using the same equipment that we currently use, just more of it and slightly larger, but the same, there's no, everything is uh, from readily available. Uh, equipment. And our charge and discharge rates, um, we've tested with LCO, with NMC, we're currently testing with LFP uh, chemical configuration, and, and we have the same uh, performance across the piece. In terms of uh, um, where we are, we are expanding globally. Um, so as I mentioned, we're expanding into um, 
Europe and North America. We are going to do a finance raise in Q1 2023. And we're also recruiting uh, technical, commercial and production teams in Europe and North America to complement the team uh, down in New Zealand. Um, it's a very experienced board. We've received financing from industry partners. Um, and we're there, the team is very sort of New Zealand oriented in terms of the fact they very careful in, in their approach and, and um, how they develop the, uh, the batteries and they feel they can move from technological and commercial proving to scale up. And that's the stage where we are at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome any questions. Great, thanks so much, Alex. And um, we've already got a question in the Q&A box. Um, can carbon skate graphite be combined with silicon to create graphite silicon mixes for high performance anodes for lithium ion batteries? The simple answer is yes. And we have some uh, processes underway. Um, I, I can't say very much about that, but we have some processes underway in, in that area. Um, the key factor here is around the surface area. You know, how good is the carbon scape graphite as a scaffold for the silicon that's doped into it? And because our process is tunable, we can um, have a large surface area or we can have a very tight surface area. So we, we can adjust the, the morphology of the, of the graphite to match what you need to place within the graphite. Great, and um, thank you so much, Alex. Um, it was really, really interesting to hear about Carbonscape. Um, and we'll now move on to our next speaker. Um, so we have Jonathan from Core Shell Technologies. Thanks, Sophia. Let me um, pull up my screen here. Really appreciate the opportunity to introduce Core Shell to everyone today um, and to fill in some questions afterwards. So my name is Jonathan Tan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Core Shell Technologies. We call ourselves Battery Capacity Unlocked because we our mission is to unlock the maximum capacity of batteries without having to reinvent the battery manufacturing ecosystem that's already been uh, ramped up today. Um, our mission is, is pretty simple, as, as everyone here knows and as everyone has talked about. The world can't wait for better batteries. We're ramping up the EV um, ecosystem and renewable energy storage is, is uh, well on the, the way. Uh, and so we need to unlock the true capacity and economics of batteries in a timely fashion in order to enable this deployment of clean energy. Um, and that's what we aim to do uh, at a, a high level. And so some of the things that come out of that for us is um, enabling higher performance batteries at lower cost. I think a lot of folks have focused on this uh, um, increase in capacity, increased performance, but um, are not focusing enough on lowering the cost per kilowatt hour as, as we are. Uh, that leads us to a second factor, which is ready and scalable manufacturing. Uh, we feel like we have one of the few paradigm shifting solutions that actually makes manufacturing easier and lower cost. And I'll talk about that. And then finally, future-proof platform. So uh, the ability to work on various different um, lithium ion and beyond lithium types of um, chemistries. So just jumping into exactly what we're focused on, which is solving um, surface level degradation on the surface of anodes and cathodes, really focusing on that uh, formation of SCI or CEI that really can drive battery performance and uh, lead to lift loss of capacity, but can also destabilize your battery for thermal runaway. And so the concept between uh, behind core shells capabilities is fairly simple instead of allowing your your surface of your anode or cathode to continuously degrade during the cycling um, we can coat the surface of your anode or cathode with a precise nanolayer film that still allows lithium to go through but uh, can prevent those side reactions from occurring um, we're not the first to come up with this concept of coating your anode and cathode but a few things that differentiate us uh, we do things in a low-cost solution-based uh, technology which can be uh, intimately scalable. We can do things in a roll to roll and code a full electrode using a single process as well as active material particles. So that's really what we hang our hat on. Um, in terms of some of the device characteristics that we can unlock, first um, is much greater um, voltage range as well as greater energy dense materials such as silicon anodes that can increase the capacity without having to sacrifice a lifetime of your batteries. The second, as uh, people are moving to much higher energy batteries, we've seen uh, safety incidents being rampant throughout the industry. And so um, with the same coatings that can increase voltage range and energy density, uh, we can also improve thermal runaway characteristics by um, pushing that thermal runaway temperature up above 200 degrees C or more. 
Um, second, as, as I mentioned, um, one of the key aspects that I think is um, a key advantage for CoreShell is that we have something that is scalable to large scale battery production. Um, we've demonstrated our coatings now in a roll-to-roll -to -roll tool that we've piloted, um, which integrates seamlessly into the current roll-to-roll -roll production that's used in high throughput gigafactories today. And in fact, as I mentioned, we can save on the back end of formation and aging processes by replacing a very timely and capital intensive step on the back end with our upfront uh, low cost roll to roll coding tool. So instead of uh, forming our SEI on the back end, we can code an artificial SEI in a cheap, fast processing technique. Uh, as I mentioned, we're doing this across different generations. We've shown efficacy, of course, in current lithium ion by improving voltage range. Um, but we're super excited also to now uh, have enabled um, some promise in low-cost metallurgical grade silicon anodes at high content, as well as the next generation of high manganese cathodes. Uh, and we've started also doing quite a bit of work on enabling faster charging lithium metal, um, as well as some solid state battery work as well. So interfacial challenges across different generations is really where we focus on. Uh, we've done this on a number of numerous um, commercial demonstrations with some major battery manufacturers and automotive OEMs and battery materials producers, uh, some that have been publicly announced. We've worked with BASF, the leading cathode producer in the world for a number of years now. We have um, we are finalists for the EV battery challenge, which is of course with LG and Hyundai. Uh, and we have a number that we can't announce because they're under confidentiality, but um, we're looking for more collaborations and uh, more opportunities to demonstrate our, our technology to um, leaders in the battery space. Uh, our background is really in thin film processing. So my co-founder and I both came from a thin film materials background, uh, taking projects from R&D and scaling them to full commercialization. So we know what industrial thin film processing looks like. Uh, we also know how to make uh, advanced world leading thin film materials. And so it's a combination of materials processing as well as uh, industrial scaling that's unique to us. We've got some great advisors, including Mark Tarpening, the co-founder of Tesla, um, as well as numerous other folks from the um, battery and EV space that are have joined the team. So uh, where we are, we're a Series A company. We just raised our Series A at the end of last year. We're scaling now. Um, and a couple of things that we're looking for, uh, of course, talent, uh, talented folks. Uh, we are going to be doing quite a bit of scaling this year and next year, uh, taking our projects from small scale to um, pilot and then um, early commercial production within the next two years. Uh, so we're looking for folks to do that. And we're also looking for um, more partners and, and customers who are interested in working with us and testing our thin film coatings for their battery electrodes. Uh, so that's us. Um, and I'm happy now to, to take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, so we don't have anything in the Q&A box at the moment. Um, if you have any questions for Jonathan, please put your um, please put your answers um, in the Q&A box. Um, so I guess I can ask a question. Um, so I, I saw the the term um, in your in your slides. You know, you were talking about how you have like a chemistry agnostic uh you know that that's what your company is and um, could you maybe speak a bit more to that and what you think the advantages of that are yeah um i i think it allows us to work on both cathodes and anodes of various different types uh for example silicon anode uh coating uh needs to be elastically uh dynamic enough to withstand the volumetric expansions of something like that um so we can design the coating material to specifically cater to silicon anodes but on the cathode side it doesn't necessarily need to have that same elasticity so having a platform technology where we can design custom materials uh both organic and inorganic types really allows us to work with a variety of different lithium ion flavors that are coming out today that's great um so we've got time for one more question um so uh wondering if the interfacial design is more targeted at liquid electrolyte system or a solid electrolyte system as well yeah it's a great question uh thus far we've, we've definitely worked more with liquid electrolyte systems just because that is the predominant market that's out there today uh, but as everyone knows interfacial challenges are actually uh, even more critical i think for solid state of the next generation so we do have some projects there they're more future thinking and more r d efforts but we have uh, definitely done some work on, on both the liquid electrolytes as well as the solid state great thank you so much um, so now we'll move on to our final speaker of the night, um, who is Bing from Nanode. 
Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Bing. I'm CEO of Nano Battery Technologies, and our technology is supposed to redefine the future of the battery anodes. Uh, so, um, let me to, yeah. So thank you for other amazing CEOs talking about graphite and other battery materials to just make my life so much easier here. So uh, as we all know, uh, graphite is an important part of current lithium ion batteries, but the problem uh, are of the energy value, uh, the volume uh, metric energy density, as well as the safety and the heavy energy input in the production. But as we need more batteries in the future, everyone's looking for like new materials and new solutions that can like offer a better way for us to use battery materials and to get to higher energy density batteries. So uh, at Nano, we are providing one of the potential solutions here. Uh, as you may see on my slides already, we are making team-based nanostructured alloy anode is uh, very different from silicon or lithium metal. And uh, why we choose this is one, this material is um, uh, have and like by its uh, chemistry nature, it has high energy density and the structure is relatively easy to engineer. So we can build the microstructures that accommodate to target discharge volume expansion. Uh, and also this material is really, really easy to scalable. And this is one of a few, um, um, like uh, our future industrial uh, production potential look like. So if you think of any other and all the material, none of them can produce in a way like we are doing here. So overall, by using our anode, we can increase the battery volumetric energy density by 50% and reduce 60% overall cost and also uh, lower the uh, greenhouse gas emission as well. So compared to the currently industrial standard uh, slurry process, our process is one step and it's dry, it's really, really simple. So it's faster, cheaper, and more greener than the existing process. And also uh, this is our cost overview. We can save a lot through using less material, less labor, and save a lot on equipment. Uh, compared to other uh, anode solutions, we are the ones that can combine the high energy density and the inexpensive uh, scaling capability. So we are um, uh, quite unique on the market right now using this one-step dry process. And uh, how we are making money, we position ourselves as a battery cell component supplier. We know our strength is on the anode side. We are focused on developing teen alloy anode. And this market itself is a billion dollar market. And we hope to supply our material to cell manufacturer companies and make their product more competitive in the market. Uh, this is what we have. Uh, uh, we have uh, several prototypes. This is one of the micro batteries we are making with uh, uh, one of our customers now. So it's a jelly road, uh, um, a small micro cylindrical cell, and we are able to re using our end ribbon to replace the graphite coated copper uh, current collector. And we've also made uh, pouch cells demonstrations with uh, uh, third party and also in the lab, like uh, with this uh, uh, road uh, end ribbon is the ones we are making. This is one of uh, my two scientists holding a like 10 meters long of a ribbon that we are make in the lab. Yeah, and uh, just on the side, we are also developing some powder material based on some of our customer uh, demands. So uh, this one is going to be fit directly in the existing process if um, like anyone is interested. So for our, our developing roadmap, currently we are kind of focused on the smaller size, the batteries are more, more in the consumer electronics, but looking to the future, we are also willing to go into electrical vehicle market. Um, our team is based in uh, University of Alberta uh, at Edmonton, Canada, and we also went through Berkeley SCADAC, so we have the good connections in both US and Canada and get lots of support from both governments. Yeah, so happy to take any questions and uh, feel free to reach out. We are looking for uh, like uh, collaborators and partners in our next step scaling up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bing. Um, so we have a question in the Q&A box. Um, could you elaborate more on the application of your anode product, 
product um, based on their electrochemical pro properties um, and how what's the fast charging property like? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So our biggest value proposition is that we provide the, uh, uh, the very high volumetric energy density, the same as the lithium metal anode. But at the same time, we produce in like a, um, uh, we can produce you know, like a simple um, method and it's very safe. So currently, um, uh, we are focusing more on the wearable devices where the, vol vo the volume of the battery is a key, for example, on the smartwatch or the wireless earphones where there is only uh, like a small, uh, small amount of volume that you can work with on your batteries. But like I uh, said in my presentation, this is a, um, like a, um, by the chemistry, it can be used in any kind of batteries, but it's more of like, uh, oh, do I need uh, more volume in my battery if there is a uh, an application that we require the battery to have a small volume, that's where it will fit. Great, thank you. Um, are there any more questions for Bing before we wrap up the call? Um, I can't see anything in the Q&A box so far, um, but I'll be sending a follow-up email uh, to this event with information um, about all of the companies that you've heard from today. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers, and it was so fascinating to hear um, about your companies. Um, I'd also like to thank our co-hosts, uh, the Volta Foundation, who I talked about at the beginning of the talk. Um, I'd really like um, to, we'd really like to do more events like this in the future, more live events, both in person and online. I mentioned the in-person event we had last week in London at the beginning of the call. Um, so if there are any events you'd like to see, um, please let us know, please get in touch. Um, and if you have any feedback on this event um, and what you'd like to see next time, um, just let us know. Um, so yeah, thank you again to all of our speakers um, and thank you all for joining. Um, more information will be coming your way in the follow-up email about all of our companies um, and the Volta Foundation and Interpolation Station as well. Um, it was great to see you and uh, have a lovely evening, everybody. Bye.